It was around this time last year when I decided to use Craigslist as a means to sell a few things I had to get rid of. My house was getting cluttered and I planned to get some new furniture, and with winter right around the corner, I wanted to get these things out fast. The main piece I was selling were these two lounge chairs in my living room. They were really big and a bit outdated, but still fully functional and didn't have any stains or rips on them. It only took about half a day for a few responses to come in, but two of the three gave me lowball offers, so there was really only one guy who was serious about buying them. He wanted to take a look at them after work that day, sometime around 6 or 6.30 I thought. I of course agreed, just happy to get them out quickly. Now usually I'd try to meet up somewhere public, but honestly I didn't have a way to transport the chairs and even if I did, I don't think I could lift them myself anyway I reasoned, so I sent him my address. Come six o'clock, I turned on the front porch light and opened up the curtains on the windows, then sat in the living room on my phone while I waited for them to show up. I remembered. Probably twenty minutes passed before a truck pulled into my driveway. They took a few minutes before getting out and walking up to the door. I said hi and let him in, I recalled. He was an average-looking man, late twenties or early thirties, wearing typical work clothes. His name was Matt and he started up some small talk, telling me about why he was excited about getting the chairs and everything. The guy seemed really nice and I felt relieved that this would be quick and easy, I thought. We walked around the chair and sat in it and seemed to enjoy it. We talked about price and he was good to give me what I listed it for, but just as we were about to exchange cash, we both heard a car door slam shut. It sounded like it was right in the driveway where he'd parked his truck, I realized. Matt quickly went outside to check on it and I just watched, not really sure what was going on. I looked through the window and there were no other cars out there, so someone had to have been messing with his truck. A minute later, Matt came in clearly angry and said someone stole a bunch of stuff out of his car, I recalled. I could tell that he was not so trusting of me like he thought I had something to do with it. I obviously didn't and I said that, but he was right to be skeptical and I was also right to be skeptical of him. I still didn't know if this was some kind of setup, but before anything could be worked out, we heard footsteps quickly approaching the front door I remembered. We turned and looked over, seeing a guy in a hood push the door open and step inside my house. His eyes were bloodshot and he looked nothing short of insane. He stared at us, standing just a few feet away, looking like he was in a complete state of rage I recalled. The guy was young though, only a kid, maybe 18 or 19 years old, but still dangerous nonetheless. Both Matt and I stood still, trying to not provoke anything to happen, but then Matt started telling the kid to take it easy. He held his hands up and took a step closer, but the kid was quick to pull the weapon out of his pocket and aim it right at him I recounted. Yes, it could have been fake, but there was no way to tell, and from the way the kid was acting, I really don't think it was he yelled at Matt to walk out the door, and now in shock he did as he said. The kid then followed him out of the house and held him at gunpoint the whole way to the truck I continued. I watched in terror as he pulled out and drove away, obviously outside of Matt's will as soon as they were gone, I called 911, then ran to my car and tried to follow them while describing what was going on to the operator, but they were gone. I couldn't find any sign of them, I admitted. The police ran an investigation, using the information I had to quickly identify who Matt was and his truck's license plate. Over the next couple days, I was just waiting for a call, but that call never came. Both Matt and his truck still have never turned up, I sighed. I feel guilty, like I should have done more, but everything was so risky, and I likely could have lost my life as well, and even in those final moments of the interaction, I didn't know for sure if Matt was in on it, as some sort of elaborate plan, I don't know what that kid wanted, or why any of it happened. It's been almost a full year though, and I don't think it's likely that anything more will be known I concluded. I've always been a fan of perusing Craigslist for deals and uncovering unique items that elude mainstream stores. One day, I chanced upon an ad for a vintage record player in impeccable condition. Unable to resist, I promptly fired off an email to the seller to inquire about it. To my surprise, Jack, the seller, replied within minutes, and our conversation swiftly delved into the specifics of the item. Jack appeared friendly and eager to facilitate the sale as we exchanged messages. We agreed to meet later that week at his apartment to finalize the transaction. When the appointed time arrived, I found myself at the apartment complex and made my way to Jack's unit. Upon entering, 
A sense of unease washed over me. There was an indefinable strangeness lingering in the air. Jack greeted me warmly, albeit with a peculiar energy. He seemed jittery and on edge, though I attributed it to natural anxiety. Upon inspecting the record player, I was delighted to discover it was in even better condition than depicted in the photos. Just as I was prepared to proceed with the purchase, Jack interjected, proposing to show me something intriguing in another room. Though hesitant, I consented, and we ventured to the back of the apartment. In that room, an assortment of seemingly random objects cluttered the space. Jack directed my attention to a large trunk tucked away in a corner, suggesting there might be something of interest inside. As he lifted the lid, a musty odor assailed my senses, causing dizziness. Beneath a tattered white sheet lay an unknown object, but I found myself unable to investigate further, overwhelmed by the noxious scent. Sorry I managed, the smell is overwhelming I turned away, intending to leave, but Jack persisted, urging me to take a quick look, promising I wouldn't regret it. Disconcerted by the encounter, I ignored his pleas and swiftly departed the apartment, my head spinning. Struggling to maintain my balance, I hurried to my car, driven by an urgent need to escape. Within moments, I succumbed to the overpowering sensation of lightheadedness, losing consciousness briefly. Upon regaining awareness, I found myself parked in a nearby neighborhood, disoriented and bewildered. The subsequent events are hazy in my memory. Darkness enveloped the sky, and my thoughts were clouded. Somehow I managed to navigate home, gradually emerging from the fog of confusion. As clarity returned, I contacted the authorities, recounting my unsettling experience. The police visited Jack's apartment, yet he denied the existence of any such trunk, and their search yielded nothing incriminating. Despite the lack of tangible evidence, I remained convinced that something was amiss. Perhaps it was paranoia, or maybe the noxious odor was indeed a potent substance emanating from the trunk. Had I lingered longer, the outcome might have been dire. This happened quite a while back when I was 18 years old. I lived with my folks, even though I had recently moved on from secondary school. I just purchased another PC. Furthermore, after I was finished getting it set up, I posted my old one on Craigslist. It was just two years old. Yet in those days, that implied it was obsolete. It was a Dell PC with fair specs, and it was very nearly 2,000 bucks fresh out of the box. I was asking for just 500 because more current workstations at the time were significantly better. After posting it on the web, I didn't need to wait long for a reaction. A person named Toby informed me I was inspired by the PC, but I needed to see it first. I needed to set up a chance to meet next week when I would be in Midtown. That way we could meet at a bistro or something like that. At the point when I proposed it, Toby said that he wanted it immediately. Therefore, I consented to allow him to approach my home. I realized gathering in a public place would be more brilliant. Be that as it may, our home was in suburbia, and I didn't have a vehicle. I realized it was apathetic and moronic. Yet I gave him my residence. My folks weren't home, and I figured it'd be a speedy deal, and that nothing would turn out badly. Toby appeared sometime thereafter, on a Saturday at around 7 p.m., I saw a more seasoned van maneuver into the carport, and a man got out. In any case, he was in good company. He had one more person with him. The two of them were no less than 30, a lot greater than me. When that's what I saw, I felt somewhat frightened. Something about their presence felt off. In any case, I forgot about the inclination. All things considered, they were only there to check a PC out. I let them in, and we set up in the kitchen. I started showing the PC to Toby, and afterward, his companion promptly requested that I utilize the restroom. I pointed him to the correct heading, which was not far off and down a short passage. Then, at that point, I zeroed in on showing the PC to Toby. Around 10 minutes passed while we were checking it out. I had deleted it in advance, so it was fundamentally running as new. Then, at that point, I unexpectedly understood that the other man hadn't gotten back from the washroom. Hello, he's your companion. Good, I asked Toby. No doubt. You can take some time some of the time, just relax. He consoled me. I tuned in as intently as I could and heard strides that weren't coming from the washroom region. They were coming from higher up. Since there were only the three of us in the house, I realized it was him. The restroom was on the fundamental floor, so there was not a great explanation for him to be up there. That was the point at which I began to overreact inside, however. I attempted to conceal it. I nonchalantly got some information about his companion once more trusting my anxiety wasn't appearing. His reaction was cold and frightening. 
He put his hand on my shoulder, not in a well-disposed way, but rather with a ton of strain. He told me not to stress over it. His grasp was fixed agonizingly. Furthermore, at that time I realized this was something other than a deal that turned out badly. We were being ransacked. That was most likely the arrangement all along. Alarm set in that I attempted to keep my poise. I advised Toby to take anything they desired and simply go however. He didn't give up. His grasp on my shoulder felt hard. It resembled danger. What's more, I began to shake. I realized I needed to move quickly. I figured out how to split away in arbitrarily my father's office on the primary floor, locking the entryway behind me. I left my telephone on the kitchen table, which was a dumb slip-up. Fortunately, however, there was a landline in the workplace where I was, so that saved me. My heart was beating as I dialed 911, making sense of the circumstances for the dispatcher. The man is trusting that the police will show up on the longest day of his life. I could hear the two men stepping around the house, most likely taking anything they might find. They probably realized the police were on their way since they took off in no time and cleaned out the front window as they returned to the van on the carport and dashed away. At the point when I was certain they were gone, I emerged to see what was taken. The main things I saw missing on the fundamental floor were the little television in the kitchen and the PC that I was selling. Notwithstanding, I later figured out that a large portion of my mother's gems were taken, as well as no less than $200 in real money. The police appeared around 10 minutes after the burglars left. They remained for some time. However, at that point they left without making any commitments. He was unacceptable. That was the last I heard from the police about what occurred. I contacted them a few times, yet they never hit me up. At the point when my folks and sister returned home, I needed to make sense of what occurred. They generally thought I was kidding from the outset since I have a dull, funny bone. Yet, when they figured out it was genuine, they were distraught as well. I would gauge the misfortunes at around $3,000, which was a tremendous amount of cash for me at that point. Since it was all my issue, I needed to take care of it. That was essentially my entire summer of work down the channel. It was the last time I met an unusual individual off the web. If I was ever to rehash it, there'd be no chance I would allow them to come to my place. It's a public or private arrangement with no exemptions. It was May of last year and I had just signed a lease on a new house. It turns out the refrigerator was not the subject of a deal. I will spend most of my money on the house. So I started looking for a cheap one at garage sales. I haven't found any way this way. Therefore, I miss Craigslist. After only 10 minutes, a person appeared not far from me. I called the number and a nice woman answered. She said the refrigerator was still for sale but she couldn't guarantee it would still be there when I arrived. So against my better judgment. I asked him about PayPal and sent him $75. She sent me an email confirming that she had received the money and we set a date for me to pick it up. That Saturday I texted him to let him know I was on my way. The house was a beautiful ranch style house probably built in the 80s. I knocked on the door and this hot girl with brown hair and a very short haircut answered. After choosing field work, I asked her about Sunny, and she said it was her and took me inside. I have no reason to worry. Just like the outside, the house is well finished and smells clean. We chatted for a few minutes until a tall guy, at least six foot five, covered in tattoos, appeared from the kitchen. She introduced me as John, her boyfriend, and told me he was going to take me to the refrigerator. She disappeared behind the house, and I never saw her again. John led me through the kitchen to the garage door. He opened the door and pointed to the refrigerator. He was in front of me, almost sitting against the high door. I could barely see it because the garage was so dark. I asked him if he had a light, but he said it was broken and they hadn't had a chance to fix it. It's not serious. He had to open the high door so I couldn't get out. Anyway, I asked him to pick it up, but he said it was also broken. He apologized. I was just about to present it to the House of Commons. This upsets me, but I have no other choice. Right now. There was a bit of light coming from inside the house. It must have done that. I took two, maybe three steps into the garage before realizing there was plastic on the floor. I looked down and saw it covering the entire floor. That's when I started to worry. I don't see any reason why I should be there, except that I would stop walking. John's shadow began to get closer. Then in the left corner I heard shuffling. Everything in me speaks of leaving. Suddenly I turned around and quickly went back to open the door. I was surprised that John was so close to me, but I continued. I snuck up to him and said, ah, I left the stroller in the truck and I'll be right back. 
Not far away there was a cart leaning against the wall. He pointed at it and was about to say something but I didn't stop. When I was sure he was no longer behind me, I ran the rest of the way to my truck door. I jumped in and out of there. I don't know what happened after that. I received a few messages from Dawn but posted them without reading them. When I got home, I logged on to Craigslist to report them. I was shocked to see that the list was gone. I looked around for another 30 minutes to make sure they deleted it immediately. I also called the police and reported it. They seemed a bit skeptical about my request but promised to check. I never heard from them again and I didn't care. I'm alive and that's enough for me. For the $75, I have no chance of asking for a refund and it's not worth getting involved with these monsters anymore. Since then I haven't gone there anymore. The whole system seems dangerous to me these days. Anyway, a week later I got lucky and a thrift store in my neighborhood had a used refrigerator. It cost $100, but it's much nicer than this one, and it serves its purpose very well. And in conclusion, I don't want to mislead people. I don't think Craigslist is dangerous, and it's free. Thousands of people collect their belongings every day without any problems. But after what happened to me, I don't think it's worth it. However, if you find anything on the site, just be careful. Bring a friend when picking them up if you can meet in a public place during the day. But more importantly, use your head in the situation may seem fuzzy and could be the difference between life and death. Some might find it odd, but I have a passion for collecting VHS movies. With over 1,000 pieces in my collection, it grows steadily. I dedicate my weekends to scouring thrift stores and online sellers in search of unique and elusive cassettes. Occasionally, I purchase boxes of tapes, often containing personal recordings of forgotten TV shows and family moments deemed insignificant. There was a time when sharing these tapes with my girlfriend was our favorite pastime, cuddling as we watched. Amidst the mundane recordings, I occasionally stumble upon something remarkable. A few years back, while browsing Craigslist, I stumbled upon a box of tapes offered for free to the first taker due to its bulkiness. I seized the opportunity and soon found myself with 44 tapes many unlabeled or blank, fueling my love for mysteries. Yet they remained untouched in my closet for nine months as my collection expanded and consumed my spare room. Building a massive shelf to accommodate them all, I meticulously inventoried each tape as I added it to my collection. I recall the evening vividly when I realized I hadn't viewed every tape. I arranged a viewing session with my girlfriend, Brittany, who arrived around 7 p.m. After cooking dinner together and indulging in Butterfinger ice cream, we settled in to watch. We started with primetime NBC clips from 1987, followed by three HBO movies, and a 1991 wedding video Britney particularly enjoyed the latter. As I excused myself for a restroom break and a smoke, Britney suddenly screamed my name upon my return. Rushing back to her side, I found her in shock, fixated on the TV screen. Confused, I inquired about the cause of her distress but she remained speechless, only rewinding and replaying the tape. Joining her on the couch, I watched as the seemingly innocuous wedding video took a sinister turn. The recording abruptly shifted to a chilling scene of a man and a woman engaging in intimate acts. Shocked and embarrassed, I was transfixed as the situation escalated into something horrifying. The man began strangling the woman, ignoring her pleas and struggles. Even after she stopped moving, he continued, oblivious to her lifeless state. As the realization dawned on us, panic set in. The man on the tape, now alone and distraught, eventually noticed the camera and violently struck it, ending the recording with static. Brittany and I were left stunned, grappling with the reality of what we had witnessed. Uncertain of our next steps, we decided against immediately involving the authorities, fearing it might be a hoax or worse. Weeks passed with Brittany avoiding me, and when she finally called, she expressed her inability to cope with the trauma, signaling the end of our relationship. Despite my efforts to trace the origin of the tape, contacting the previous owner proved futile. With no leads and the police unable to provide further assistance, I was left to confront the unsettling truth alone. Since then, I've continued my collection, albeit with a sense of unease. The once comforting ritual of watching tapes has become tinged with fear, each unlabeled cassette holding the potential for another disturbing revelation. Collecting these glimpses of others' lives has become a haunting reminder of the darkness that may lurk beneath the surface.